It's time now for Countywide, a special presentation of Yavapai Broadcasting News. Join Paul David and Brad Miller as they talk with our community's leaders, newsmakers, and people in the know. You'll hear about the hot topics that affect all our lives here in Yavapai County. And now, here's today's Countywide. Welcome to County Wide. I'm Paul David. Great to have you in studio today. Mark Hart and Zen McCarsky with the Arizona Game and Fish Department in studio today. Last night there was a public meeting in Prescott about the uh, pronghorn antelope herd there in Prescott. Some of them are going to be relocated down into the Tucson area. So I wanted to have you guys come in and tell me a little bit more about that because uh, we've had issues with pronghorn antelope in the, in the quads here before where we, we had a herd and we didn't move them. And, and now you told me, Zen, just before the show. By the way, welcome to studio, guys. Thanks, Thanks. for having Thanks us. for coming in. Zen's all the way from Kingman. And Mark, you're all the way out of the, from Tucson area. That I am. Right. So these guys have traveled a great distance to be with us today. So I appreciate that. Uh, let's, we, we did have a pronghorn herd in the Prescott area. And years ago, we said, no, we don't want to move them. The public said no. And how's that herd doing today? <laughs> well, it became a very passionate issue is what right. happened. And uh, Game and Fish eventually backed out uh, of that capture effort. The goal was to move them. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we, you know you're going to lose a few of the animals, but let's save the majority of them, get them somewhere where they can flourish and add to a, the gene pool. Mm -hmm. uh, but it became so passionate within the, the public that we backed out. There are none left. Within, with, within a decade, they were all gone. Mm -hmm. So by the first decade of this century, there were no animals left. And, and we were going to move those because they were getting landlocked. There was going to be homes and right, roads all the way development around, around them. And, and pronghorn need, when we talk about you know, vast open spaces, we're not talking about 50, you know, 100 acres when it comes to pronghorn. I mean, we're talking vast open grasslands. Oh, really? Okay. And when you start landlocking them and making the quarters tighter and tighter, what happened was not all the pronghorn just immediately died away. What you had was a situation where the coyotes had a really easy hunting ground. Mm -hmm. They got in there. So what you had was no recruitment. There were no fawns that survived. So the population just got older and older and older and older until they were all dead and right. gone. And right. so instead of saving the majority of those animals and getting them into another population, we lost them all, okay. and I think that's a shame. Let's move on, because we don't want that happening again, and I guess we've got a herd down the Tucson area that we're going to try to save and, and, and repopulate. But let, before <clears> we do that, give me a sense of what a pronghorn antelope is. What kind of creature are we talking about here? Because some folks don't even know what that is. They're, they're an amazing animal uh, in that it is by far the fastest land mammal in North America. What does it you mean speed-wise? Well, you've heard of the cheetah, obviously. Right. I think everybody associates the cheetah in Africa with, with you know. Great speed. Great speed. Yeah. And the pronghorn antelope can reach speeds upwards of about 60 miles per hour. No kidding. I mean, they can absolutely run. And their other primary defense is their, their vision. They can see uh, movement up to four miles away. And for anybody that's not quite sure what that means, set your odometer at zero, drive four miles, and take a look backwards. I can't even, I can't even you know, fathom that. It's it, amazing. It, you know, they are built for open grasslands. Uh, that's what this animal's designed. And, and actually, I, I'm sorry, Paul, I forgot to bring a, a skull with me. I meant to so that we could show the nasal passage of a pronghorn. So okay. one of the things, if you're going to hit speeds, if a human ran at speeds of 60 miles an hour, our hearts would explode. We couldn't take wow. in enough oxygen. Their nasal passage is huge. And uh, so they can take in a lot of oxygen, uh, allows them to maintain these speeds. Maybe more impressive is huh. the fact of how long they can run at, say, 35 miles an hour. I mean, they can just keep running and running and running. And this is a primary defense. So you're not going to find them in heavily forested areas, you're not rocky, uh, mountainous areas. You're not going to find them in those areas. When you're driving through flat, open grasslands, what you're looking at is pronghorn habitat. And that's what we see when we go over to Prescott. If you come over, over Mingus Mountain or anything, you get those big flat areas with the tall grasses. You can see them off in the distance, those, those spiky black antlers. Right, and that's how horns. Pronghorn, antlers. pronghorn. Horns. So they got pronged horns. Right. So there you go. Okay. And, grasslands and speed is what they're all about. And then when they have their young, they drop the fawns in the tall grasses. And I know there was years in the past where we've actually um, watched for coyotes to come in because we haven't had a whole lot of tall grass for those fawns to sit in to be hidden. Right. So we've removed the coyotes to allow the fawns to mature. Well, for the fawns, they mm -hmm. have only one defense, and that is hide. Mm -hmm. 
If they can't hide, they're easy pickings for a coyote. Yeah, well, no, no and trees and no nothing like that. So then, tall, tall yeah. grass, what they would do is mom won't stand next to the fawn. She'll kind of go off somewhere else. The fawn will just lie down and be real still. Mm -hmm. And essentially you hope that the coyote walks right by. Well, in times of drought when that grass is, is way down low and there's no hiding cover, obviously that's a real problem for for prong -horn Easy fawns. picking, easy yeah. picking. All right, well, before we talk about any more about the Prescott herd, it's the Tucson area herd. And, and Mark, you can tell us better as to where this herd is located and kind of the numbers and what the issues are with that herd. So kind of fill us in with what's going on with those uh, animals down there. Well, south of Tucson, we do have two herds that are struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, one in the Sonoida Elgin area, which numbers about 50 to 60 individuals. And then an even smaller herd in the San Rafael Valley which is near the border, that's about 15 to 20 individuals. Okay. So this month, if all goes as planned, we will be adding uh, pronghorn to those populations in the hopes uh, that they will survive long term. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the case of Sonoida Elgin, we've done a lot of advance work in terms of improving the habitat, specifically modifying fencing, approximately 50 miles of fencing, to enable the pronghorn to easily go under them and have uh, corridors of movement. We've cleared approximately 4,000 acres of invasive mesquite and juniper. Wow. Uh, improved 13 water catchments and did a controlled burn uh, covering about 320 acres. So all of those have happened over the past uh, several years and it makes it much uh, better habitat than it might have been otherwise for the pronghorn. Now what has happened down there to <clears throat> to dwindle the numbers. I, I guess I'm trying to figure, the first thing I want to try to figure out is, is when we talk about a healthy herd, what kind of numbers are we talking about there? Because you said 50 to 60 in the one herd. Right. Yeah, so how many numbers would we like to we see would, in a herd? We would like to see well over 100 to 120, okay. uh, you know, upwards of 200. That may be uh, hopelessly optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, part of the problem with these isolated populations is in breeding and bad genetics over time. We've also had to do uh, quite a bit of predator management to ensure that the fawns survived. Three years ago, we had a zero survival rate on uh, fawns. Oh. Uh, we did some predator management, and in the following two years, had uh, 20 fawns survive and then another 17, which built the herd up uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. So we would like to see those numbers, obvious on both these herds climb quite a bit. The San Rafael is a tricky situation because it's so close to the border and the pronghorn will go back and forth between the U.S. and Mexico. We can't account for what happens to them there, but we have our suspicions. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to rebuild that herd to greater numbers. Hopefully we can do so with some of the pronghorn we're taking uh, from Chino Valley, but also from New Mexico. Uh, that'll happen early next week. Uh, but the focus of the efforts have been Sonoida Elgin. We have approximately 60 a uh, thousand acres of prime habitat between two locations. One, the Empire Ranch on the, uh, on, in a BLM uh, land management area, mm -hmm. and another 12,000 on a location known as Rose Tree Ranch. Okay, let's take our first break already. Zen Makarski and Mark Hart with the Game and Fish Department are in studio today. We're talking about the relocation of some of the antel, pronghorn antelope in the Quad City area. I'm Paul David, this is Countywide. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Remember all those rules you heard as a child? Do not play with fire. You'll always remember those rules. Don't sit so close to the screen. But now there are times you may have to challenge those rules. Stay inside the lines. And bending those rules may even lead to a career. Pick up your toys, kids. Imagine all the possibilities. When you venture out to make your life your own, remember the rules, but don't be afraid to take chances. Explore your sense of wonder. Feed your curiosity. Yavapai College. Life Explored. moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. They say that when you're facing extreme danger, your life flashes before you.
If you think that's sad, consider facing it before you even have enough life to flash before your eyes. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Deaths and injuries can be prevented by using the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to know what is appropriate for each age and size. Welcome back to County Wide. Great to have you in studio today. Mark Hart and Zen Makarski from Game and Fish Department are in studio today. One more question for Mark is, and, and I just figured some people maybe at the public meeting last night that you had over in the Quad City area might have this question too, is if, if the herds in Tucson are having a difficult time surviving down there, why not capture them and move them out of that area and put them in a different location? Well, the simple answer is they belong there. Historically, they range there, and in fact, um, there were huge pronghorn herds in the Tucson or south of Tucson in places like the Altar Valley historically. And as a wildlife management practice, Arizona Game and Fish attempts to restore native species to their historic ranges wherever possible. So that's what we're trying to do. That is a very good answer. All right. Um, let's talk about the herd that is going to be, well, I, I, maybe I should mention, the Associated Press put out a story today. We've been talking about, Zen, you sent me a release, I think it was last week, about the public meeting coming mm -hmm. up tonight, maybe two weeks ago. But the Associated Press said that 200 pronghorn from a northern New Mexico ranch are going to be herded next week. And then some of them will be going to different locations, but some of them will be going to, I think, your area in specific. Is that right? That's correct. Approximately 40 of the pronghorn from uh, the Cimarron area in New Mexico will be coming our way. Some will supplement the populations we've been talking about in the San Rafael and Sonoyta Elgin areas. Um, another uh, population we're looking at is in Bonita, which is near Wilcox, Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an interesting uh, project because it involves a swap of wildlife. In exchange for the 40 pronghorn that are coming our way, we are going to provide New Mexico with approximately 60 Gould's turkeys over the next two to three years. Uh, that's another example of us uh, working with uh, species native to our area and redeveloping the populations. Mm -hmm. There were no Gould's turkeys in southeastern Arizona 20 years ago. We have a thousand now because oh, wow. of relocation efforts, enough that we can provide some to another state so that we can get wildlife that we need here. Swapping animals, that's great. Swapping wildlife, that's a great way to do it. Let's talk a little bit about the herd and the, the capture of the herd that's going to be going on. Where are they located and when's the capture going to be taking place in, in our neck of the woods here? Okay, well, the capture is going to take place in the Chino Valley area. Okay. And that area is like a pronghorn baby factory. I mean, they just it just does really, really well. Chino and, has what it takes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it does. And so it can support... Uh, an effort like this in regards to moving some and restoring it. And, you know, we talked about the Tucson area. Well, who knows down the road? This, all that work that's been done down in south of Tucson supports a, a, this herd and it grows. That may be able to support another relocation effort somewhere else in the state Good where point. pronghorn have been, uh, where they've disappeared or their numbers have gone down. The, the whole point of this, I think, is making sure that generations down the road will still have wildlife in the state of Arizona. And so the, the Chino Valley can support it, we're going to do it. And it's a corral trap set up and a corral trap, uh, I saw the video running just a minute ago and you can kind of see it where there's a straight line fence that comes down. Mm -hmm. Then there's a funnel that starts out here and kind of curls to where it kind of bottlenecks. And then there's a gate at the end and it's, it's wide open, obviously, and we got people on each side. And as we can push the pronghorn through there, the first gate will be shut, okay. trapping the pronghorn. Then some people will essentially walk at the pronghorn, wave their hands, and push them down into a corral. Just like you'd herd cattle, basically. Right, and at which point another gate shut. And then the pronghorn uh, go behind the curtain, and as everybody gets ready, uh, they're behind the curtain and it's covered all the way around. So the visual aspect isn't there. They can't see a bunch of people Why? walking around uh, because they're very visually oriented. Okay. So they'll stress out the more people they see. And what you do is you open the curtain, you let up, I don't know, 10 or what, whatever can support. You know how there's people for every pronghorn in okay. there. And you'll release a few pronghorn. They're mugged, tackled, brought to the ground as quickly as possible. 
and it minimizes the potential for injury. How, real quick before we, we, you said mugged. Now, how big of an animal are we mugging here? <clears throat> They're not real big. Okay. Um, Mark, what's that mean to you though? What, what does that mean to you? Because what's not real big to you might be right? big to me. But What kind of weight are we talking about? I think 80, 90 pounds, sure. I, I don't remember. Okay, but, um, all right. They, they, it can be real dangerous in there and sure. a lot of precautions are taken, not just for the pronghorn, but for the humans getting in into that corral with them. Uh -huh. uh, their hind feet in particular are very, very sharp. Oh, I'm sure. And they will kick, they'll whip their heads back. I think I sent you a picture of Gunnar Erickson who uh, caught one of the head whips uh, where the head snaps back and went right in the face. Mm -hmm. We had another individual uh, who needed a number of surgeries on his finger uh, to get it fixed because it got mangled up pretty good uh, in there. So. And nobody gets in there without safety glasses on, uh, no belt buckles, uh, keys, things like that all come out of your pockets. Uh, so precautions are done. And you want to minimize the potential for injury for, for both sides, for the animal and for the humans. Right. And getting them on the ground, you get their eyes covered. Again, very visual. So you want to cover up their eyes, try and uh, calm them down a little bit. Uh, they are given a sedative uh, during transport. To, to minimize the overall stress. They're fragile, and aren't they? they? You were telling be. me before the show, they're a pretty fragile animal, and I was kind of surprised they're to hear that. They're a high-stress animal, I think, is a real good way to put they're it. They're worry words. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess so, I would be, too, if, you know, a chopper was chasing me across the ground, and I'm in a pen, and now I've got people mugging me. You know, me. if it was so easy <laughs> that you could go out there, whistle, and say, come on, get in right, the corral, right. you know, we're, we're, well, all we're going to do is put you in the transport, bring you somewhere else, and let you go. If it were that easy, that'd be nice. That would but be nice. But it's, it's not that easy. You said they have a, uh, maybe a heart condition possibly could, could arise. Well, it's called capture myopathy. Okay, capture myopathy. And it's not a heart condition. It's just that the stress level reaches a point uh, for much like a human having a heart attack. Okay. And it can happen. Uh, we mentioned off the air that we had a capture some years ago where we didn't suffer a single mortality, which was really, really nice. You said it was a surprising uh, thing, too. It, it is. A lot of times you will suffer some mortality. But with this particular uh, setup that we talked about with the corral and mm -hmm. everything, that has helped a lot in regards to pronghorn captures. And it's been worked on years and years and years of, okay, what's the safest way to capture animals uh, where we minimize the potential for, uh, for mortality. Right. And this corral trap setup is, is one of the best because you're, you're not uh, net gunning them. Net gunning them is, we do a lot with bighorn sheep but it's a helicopter following and a net gunner out shoots, a net comes out, falls on the animal. Well, for pronghorn, it's a lot more difficult to do that safely uh, than say with a corral trap. It can be done and it can be done safely, uh, but this is a, better, a much be more effective way to get a large number of animals all at once, minimize stress, uh, and just get them where they need to go keep them calm as possible. We have to take another break. Zen Makarski and Mark Hart from the Arizona Game and Fish Department in studio today. I'm Paul David. This is Countywide. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. rules you heard as a child? Do not play with fire. You'll always remember those rules. Don't sit so close to the screen. But now there are times you may have to challenge those rules. Stay inside the lines. And bending those rules may even lead to a career. Pick up your toys, kids. Imagine all the possibilities. When you venture out to make your life your own, remember the rules, but don't be afraid to take chances. Explore your sense of wonder. Feed your curiosity. Yavapai College. Life Explored. A single ember from a wildfire can travel over a mile. 
That ember can ignite and destroy your home or community. You can't control where that ember will land. Only what happens before it does. Visit fireadapted.org to learn how you can help protect your community from wildfires. Welcome back to County Live. We've got a few minutes left in the program. I want to talk a little bit more about just the antelope in general with you, if I could. Why is it, do we know, why most animals will jump a fence to move forward? These guys go under fences. Why is that? It, it, it's, it boggles I, my mind that they do that. I don't know if there's a good reason why they do it. We just know through research that they do it. Right. Uh, they certainly can jump a fence and will occasionally, but they do but, not like to jump. And mm -hmm. it might have something to do with their makeup. I mean, their legs are, are well, excuse me, um, not real strong. Um, and so maybe jumping is painful for them. And... Uh, but going under fences, they'll get down real low. And essentially a fence, to be ideal for pronghorn, need an 18 inch uh, height off Gap the bottom, the bottom. Okay. Without, without barbed wire, a uh, nice smooth wire. Okay. And that way they're not ripping themselves apart as they go underneath. So that's ideal for them. Anything else unique about them, the uh, pronghorn antelope? Well, their fur is really unique. And one of the things during a capture, uh, we had uh, one of our wildlife uh, program managers was in the corral, you know, tackling pronghorn and he walks out and I didn't have my camera ready and boy, I wish I did because he came out with a pronghorn beard. Uh, all the, the fur just flies off the pronghorn. Oh really? Uh, yeah, and, but so he comes out and he's just got this, all this pronghorn fur just caked to his face. Real quick, how long does it take from a, prong, a pronghorn, okay, from the, the day it's born until it is an adult and maybe not, maybe not adult, but let's put it this way. I think at the time, and I can't remember because, I mean, it was a decade or so ago, but it was, the, the coyotes were being removed because we were just trying to give those fawns a chance to get up on their feet. Just a real short period of right. time. Now, tell me weeks. about a fawn. How long does it take before they're doing 65 miles an hour and seeing I don't know if they can like hit Superman. 65, but they can escape predators within weeks. Okay. So uh, they don't need a lot of time. They need just, you just need that short window. And when we do something like we've talked about with the coyotes, that's all we're trying to do. You're not going to eradicate coyotes. No. You're just trying to buy enough time to provide the pronghorn uh, to sustain to, the to help the population. Right. Right. Okay. And it's only done when you have certain numbers. You're not worried about predation at all, mm -hmm. because the amount of recruitment is still exceeds or at least equals uh, that which are being taken by predators. Mm -hmm. Now, when you end up with a flatlining population. That, that's when it becomes a problem. Okay. All right. We're out of time. Mark Hart, good to meet you. Thanks good for coming you. in. Zen, always good to see Thank you. Thank you for having us, And Paul. Zen, you said you'd come back and talk about bighorn sheep with me sometime. Sure, so absolutely. I think we should go through all the different species in Arizona, kind of have you guys come in and talk about that. You're going to make me an expert on everything, aren't you? Oh, I sure am. <laughs> all right. That's today's Countywide. I'm Paul David. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you again next time. So who's going to do what?